This is Roy Halladay. He's a Hall of Fame pitcher with an illustrious career. He's won two Cy Youngs for two different teams. He threw a perfect game and a no-hitter, the latter being just the second in postseason history. He was an eight-time All-Star, struck out 200 batters in five different seasons. He led the league four times in innings pitched and strikeout to walk ratio. He's in the highest echelon of Blue Jays pitchers in their history, being second all-time in wins and ERA. He won over 200 games as a starting pitcher in his career and struck out over 2,000 batters across every game he pitched. He raised two beautiful children with his lovely wife, and he was beloved pretty much everywhere he went. People had exclusively good things to say about Roy Halladay because he was a good man and an even better pitcher. He was one of my absolute favorite pitchers growing up, frustrating me to no end when he'd shut out my Mets. So today's video is a little hard for me to talk about because Roy tragically lost his life in an accidental plane crash in 2017. But all the information I just listed doesn't really have anything to do with what we're gonna be talking about today, but it's important context nonetheless. Because Roy Halladay's road to becoming this pitcher and this man was long and arduous. Today's video is gonna be about none of those things, but it felt wrong to omit them entirely. What I'll be discussing today has nothing really to do with what Roy accomplished at the end of his career, but rather everything to do with the adversity that he faced and the challenges that helped shape him to become one of the best pitchers in Major League history. Today's story is a sensitive one, one of triumph, one of failure, one that pretty much all of us can relate to regardless of what we do in our lives. And it starts all the way back in 1995 in a small town in Colorado, where a gangly, lanky teen with a mouthful of braces was absolutely dominating his high school baseball league. I think if I grew up in a town as pleasant and quiet as Arvada, Colorado, I would be just as happy as Roy was when he was a kid. From family and friends alike, Roy was often regarded as soft-spoken, keeping to himself, but ultimately a generous and nice guy. His family home was right outside of Denver, and had a basement nearly 70 feet long, large enough for a batting cage and pitcher's mound. Roy's dad constantly pushed him to be great, and that's why he was regarded as such a prodigy during his time on his high school baseball team, for Arvada West High School. Though he remained mild-mannered and soft-spoken as he grew into adolescence, he was still viewed as a team leader for his high school baseball team. When he was a junior on the team, Roy led his team to the 1994 state championship, and as a senior, he posted a whopping 10-1 record with a 0.55 ERA, giving up only five earned runs all season. By his senior year, he had sprouted to six foot six in height and was being heavily scouted across the nation for the Major League Baseball draft. And when you look at his high school numbers from his last two seasons, it's easy to see why. Roy Halladay was one of the most dominant pitching prospects in all of the country. But when you met him, he didn't really seem like a dominant force to be reckoned with. If anything, his presence was super calm and welcoming. But on June 1st, 1995, a gangly Roy Halladay, then 18 years old, smiled through his braces in the family kitchen when he was drafted by the Blue Jays in the first round with the 17th overall pick. His scouting report was super commending, taken by Tim Wilkin, a former scout of the year. He scored overall 95 out of 100, and Wilkin had high praise for his fastball, knuckle curveball, and his delivery. All signs were pointing upward for Roy Halladay, as he was on the fast track to becoming a major leaguer. He easily dominated his way through his first two years in the minor leagues, and the scouts that were baffled by the Blue Jays taking a high school pitcher, which wasn't a common thing back then, were now being left speechless, as the rise of Roy Halladay was taking place before their very eyes. A 3.40 ERA in rookie ball at age 18, an even better ERA a year later at single A+, and a little bit of struggling between double A and triple A had Roy Halladay hailed as the next big thing in Toronto. And a big thing was exactly what the Blue Jays needed. After winning back-to-back -back World Series in 92 and 93, they hadn't made the postseason since and were in desperate need of a spark plug. After a relatively mild debut going five innings and allowing two earned runs against the Tampa Bay Rays, Roy Halladay was about to take over the Toronto sports world in his start against the Tigers. He'd get only two starts in 1998 his rookie year, but he made the second one count, carrying a no-hitter against the Detroit Tigers all the way to two outs in the ninth inning before surrendering a solo home run. He'd get his first major league win in this game, but more importantly, the praise and love of the Toronto Blue Jays faithful. This would-be no-hitter would have been the third to be thrown on the last day of the season, but little did Halliday know he'd get some special no-hitters later in his career. Roy was quickly becoming a Canada folk hero. Dreams were coming true for Roy and the Halliday family, his dad's vision for his son finally coming to fruition after all these years. 
Roy maintained his shy, pensive nature even as he continued to have success in the major leagues. He'd have some ups and downs in his first full season as a big league pitcher, but he was still regarded as one of the top young talents in the game and a big piece of the Blue Jays' future going forward. He developed some close friends and his teammates, took on the role of clubhouse prankster, and was ultimately having a great time albeit for an unsuccessful Blue Jays team. And so long as he kept producing on the mound, he could stay inside his own personal bubble, where he was most comfortable. It was the place that he knew best. But come the turn of the century, in the 2000 season, Roy's world was about to be flipped on its head. By 2000, the former first round pick looked like a bust. Hitters were teeing off on his fastball, in large part because of the over-the-top delivery he'd learned as a young pitcher, which allowed them to pick up the ball early in his release. His ERA ballooned to above 10, and it remains the highest for any major league pitcher with at least 50 innings in a season. Halliday was not the same, and Toronto fans weren't sure if he'd ever get back to his rookie status. In a precautionary move, he was demoted. Not just to AAA, not even to AA, but to the lowest rung possible. Class A ball. Roy was quickly learning that the things he learned as a young pitcher and a young man were things he'd have to leave behind if he was going to last in the major leagues, because there was nowhere left to hide. Roy's closest friend in the clubhouse was Chris Carpenter, and he was obviously distraught by the news. In his own words, he said that it personally and mentally crushed Roy. Roy himself told the Toronto Star in 2000 that it was like a nightmare, the worst thing that could possibly happen, and that there was nothing he could do to make himself feel better. Roy's struggles continued as he arrived in the low minor leagues, but he maintained his bubble, and this time, there was no comfort in the bubble, just despair. Teammates had expressed concern about how much Halliday was drinking on road trips even before the demotion. Because of his drinking habits in his room, teammates had nicknamed him Minibar. He also increased his reliance on chewing tobacco, a habit he had had when he was living at home with his wife as well. She noted that she would find stacks of empty whiskey bags and tin cans containing tobacco all across his room, where Roy would lock himself in frequently. It seemed like the light was fading fast on Halliday's potential career. Halliday, who really only had his family to rely on, was about to fall further down the ladder than he could have ever imagined. And just when it seemed like everybody had given up on him, one coach brought him back to the light. Roy continuously toiled and pushed away the ones that he loved headed into the 2021 season. His mentality was still a large issue and something he'd need to overcome, but he wouldn't be able to do it without help. This is when he met Mel Queen, a former Major League Baseball pitcher and a coach in the Blue Jays minor league system. Queen was one of the few that could accurately dissect what exactly was wrong with Roy Halladay, and quickly became an important mentor for Halladay's development. Although his fastball was clocked up to 95 miles per hour, Queen noticed that it had very little movement and his pitches were up in the strike zone, which is why he was getting teed off. Queen realized that Halliday had total reliance on his strength and was only trying to overpower batters, not fool them. Within two weeks, he altered Halliday's arm angle for a more deceptive delivery and added pitches that sank and careened. Instead of throwing over the top, he chose a three quarters delivery. And originally a fastball pitcher, he became more reliant on his pitches low across the plate, regardless of the type of pitch thrown. The adjustments were successful. After a month and a half, he was promoted to AA, and a month later, to AAA in Syracuse. His best friend Carpenter remembers him coming back up to the major leagues, walking in like he belonged, with people on the team commenting behind the scenes saying, wow, this guy's a completely different dude. In terms of his performance on the mound, they were absolutely correct. Halliday's adjustments kicked off a decade of dominance, where he maintained the mechanics he picked up from Mel Queen. From 2002 to 2011, Halliday led all pitchers in wins, complete games, and shutouts. But there was an undercurrent to that decade of dominance. Halliday projected confidence to the world on the mound, but he privately struggled in a way known only to those in his tight inner circle. His addictions persisted. His anxieties never ceased. Not a flawless human being by any means, Halliday is forever immortalized as an exemplary role model for those who suffer with anxiety and addiction, for those that can find solace and an escape in their own craft. Not unlike many big leaguers that didn't live up to their potential, Halliday failed in front of millions of people in his first few seasons. But instead of his shortcomings being the tale of his career, it was his resilience instead. And though his problems and flaws lingered for a long time, Roy Halliday did not let them define him. And beyond all of his accolades and his Hall of Fame recognition, I think that's probably the most impressive thing about him. Perhaps it may seem incomplete that this video doesn't really talk about the rest of Halliday's career in that much depth. 
but my whole focus was instead to highlight the first three years because without Roy facing his demons and accepting that his way of life had to change, we wouldn't have had that Hall of Fame career to talk about. So after all that, I believe the first three years of his career to be as important as the rest of it, because one cannot exist without the other. It also speaks volumes to the subject of addiction as well, because no amount of money or success or happiness can easily eliminate that sickness. It's an ongoing trial, an ongoing challenge, but it's also one that I personally have no experience with. I can't imagine the personal turmoil that Halliday faced. I only know the quotes from him, his family, his friends, but I knew that I wanted to put together a video to tell this story regardless. Halliday positively affected my life and was a role model for me when I was younger. And in lieu of his recent passing and my learning of the challenges that he faced, I realized that the man who threw a perfect game wasn't perfect after all, and that's okay. At the end of the day, Roy Halliday and all the other big leaguers he played with and faced are just humans, like you and me. And I believe that element of personability makes this story all the more relatable to anyone watching. But that is where our story ends for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was a little emotional and tough to put together for me, so I wanted to put the appropriate amount of time into it. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like down below and leave a comment telling me your thoughts. I'm going to be spending more time on videos over the summer now that I have a lot more time to put into them and better software to work with. So look out for more content like this in the future. But that's it for today. I'm the Jolly Olive, and I'll see you guys next time. The off season, kind of miss them. Turkey or ham? Turkey, right. Bread? Of course. Yeah, fastball inside.